Well, greetings, guys. Um, uh, what a privilege uh, to uh, come and speak to you this evening. I mean, it's great fun, isn't it? Uh, the technology we have available to us today to be able to do such a thing. Uh, here you go. Here you've got a visiting speaker from New Zealand. Uh, normally, that would not be at all practical, would it, uh, for a normal club night for, to in, have an invited speaker from the other side of the world with you. But with um, Zoom and so on like that, we can do that. So uh, greetings and um, uh, good to see you all. Uh, I first uh, was asked, uh, I think it was around about 2018 to uh, attend the Visalia DX convention up there and, and um, give a presentation on what it means to be uh, to do one man de expedition work in uh, in my case in the Pacific well they've been out to many other places other than the Pacific uh, to Melanesia Micronesia uh, out in the Indian Ocean uh, as well but is specifically a, a concentrated um, tonight's presentation just on the Pacific. So what does it mean for um, uh, one person, one man, to be able to do a de-expedition? Is it, is it possible? Obviously it is, but uh, some of the logistics that are involved, uh, it can be uh, quite a bit of fun. So let me just uh, do that. Now, just a he a hands up, can you all see that uh, on your screens, everybody? Yep, yep. Yeah, I've got it. Yep, good, okay. Right, uh, very typical scene from uh, one of the Pacific Islands. And uh, as I say, my uh, presentation is called uh, The Expeditions, Digital The Expeditions. In this case, because uh, uh, mainly I was using uh, digital stuff. Uh, this is right at the, the bottom of our, the previous cycle that we've been through. Isn't it great that uh, this next cycle is on its, on its way? That's going to be a lot of fun, guys. So mainly it's been uh, digital. And uh, some of the p past adventures that I've been on has been out to the Kermitic Islands uh, in 1984, the Auckland Islands in 1988. Kermitic Islands is uh, uh, north of New Zealand by about uh, 600 miles. It, uh, the Auckland Islands are south of New Zealand by about the same, by about the same amount, midway between uh, New Zealand and the Antarctica. Then out to Norfolk Island, that's between New Zealand and Australia, up to Rotuma, which is north of New Zealand into the Pacific, NFK 0RR, that's uh, Numea. So those are some of the uh, past adventures, so to speak, and some of the more recent uh, adventures have been out into Samoa, uh, is five whiskey, zero radio, radio, four whiskey, six RR, that's uh, Timor Least, Timor Leste is just um, right on the top of Australia. If you um, uh, take a step off the top of Australia, then uh, towards um, Indonesia, you'll come across Timor or Timor Leste. A35, A35 RR, that's out in Tonga. E551 RR is South Cook Islands. South Cook Islands um, and North Cook Islands, I could easily have the same call sign and you wouldn't know where I am. So if you work in any E51 stations, please ask them where the, are they South or North Cook because you can't tell by their call sign nowadays. If you work E51 uh, Whiskey Lima, for instance, uh, uh, Warwick out there, he's up in um, uh, Penryn Island, which is in the North Cook Islands. So um, uh, the North Cooks are quite a, quite a lot rarer than South Cook Islands. The next one along, H44RR, that's it in Solomon Islands. Uh, P29RR is out in uh, Papua New Guinea. Uh, I think it can, if you haven't observed already, there's a common factor uh, happening here. And uh, so that if you hear anything uh, coming out of the Pacific region that has a, the suffix of RR, uh, you're pretty much on the money that it'll be uh, me on the other end of the key or the microphone or whatever we're using. So a couple more we could add to that, uh, which I haven't got on this slide, would be uh, uh, mainly because I'm not in the Pacific, and that's, um, well, one of them is E6AR, uh, that's a step away from the RR, but the E6AR, that's in Niue, uh, 
as soon as we're able to travel, uh, I'll be off to Niue. And then, <clears throat> then 8Q7XR, uh, <clears throat> that's out in the Maldive Islands. Um, that's right out in the, in the middle of the Indian Ocean. So those are some of the more recent expeditions we've uh, been involved with. Now, listen, we're talking about this. Uh, can you all see that fairly clearly on your screens? Hand up somewhere? Yeah? Okay. Th that circle there uh, on the map there, that's the region I'm talking about. The, the Pacific region, really, we can extend that up to the, uh, to the left, uh, top left a little bit which would include um, uh, Melanesia and Micronesia, in other words, into Papua New Guinea and Solomon Islands. But this is the region we're concentrating on. But of interest, this is, this is what you're seeing. Hold on, let me put myself up there so that you can, you can see me as well. Uh, uh, as of interest, this is what you guys uh, see uh, from your QTHs in the States. That's bird's eye view looking down and that's what, that's what the world looks like uh, to you. So I'm rather envious of that because you've got a really nice shot into uh, Western Africa in the main. Okay, I know the, I know the West Coast, East Coast debate. <laughs> but in general, you've got a good shot into Africa. You've got a good shot into Europe. But that's, because that's what the world looks like from your point of view. This is what the world looks like from the uh, uh, Pacific point of view. Now, all of a sudden, the states gets pushed out to the sides of the uh, sides of the map a bit. Um, Africa on the left hand side, there gets spread out around the place. And uh, we still get a very good shot into Asia. Um, more than a good shot, though, really more than what we really want, because uh, getting through that JA uh, uh, Chinese uh, and uh, more so the Indonesian curtain can be can be really, really difficult at times. And just to throw it in, this is what the world looks like from my QDH here in New Zealand. Now, the, uh, here's a uh, uh, interesting question for you. Can any of you please find where UK is on that map? Uh, or uh, Scotland or Ireland or a um, good portion of, uh, of Europe? That's a good question. Is that it to the north? It's a little hard to see, but well, no. yes and no. It's uh, <laughs> it's it's anywhere because the UK the is our antipode is our antipode country, so it's spread right around the outside. <laughs> oh, and that's what makes that's what makes Europe and UK uh, particularly difficult for us from here in New Zealand. Uh, and, uh, and just below New Zealand, you see that, uh, that green sort of blob there. That's what makes it almost impossible for us to get into Africa, which is that big blob spread down to the bottom there, spread out, because that smaller blob there is Antarctica. So to get into Africa, anywhere into Southern Africa or West, uh, Eastern Africa, we have to go right across the Antarctica. Antarctica is a lovely absorber of RF. Uh, so, uh, yeah, it's just, anyway, that's, I thought that might be of interest. Let's start off okay in the Southern Cook Islands. Delightful island, absolutely beautiful. That, that's a very, very typical beach scene, which I've just taken from my QSL car there. Uh, lovely, beautiful, so, uh, funny, uh, sunny, uh, fine days every day. And it's just <coughs> delightful. Uh, that, that happens to be my operating uh, <laughs> Um, position out on the deck of the, uh, the, the house that I uh, uh, frequently um, uh, rent. Just sitting out on the deck and then in the background there you can see the, uh, the trees that I, or the coconut trees which I throw an antenna up. If you're really, really um, smart and you've got your glasses on, you may even see the feeder going up into one of the, uh, one of those coconut trees going up right through the center of the photo. Is. So right. I, I normally will throw up, um, uh, that's from the operating position, just looking straight out across the backyard through the coconut trees. And then on the right hand side, the uh, out, out of the picture, you can see the beach and the coconut trees that is hanging out over the ocean there that I can uh, hang two um, 
I can't actually point to that photo, can I? <laughs> uh, between those two coconut trees, which are hanging over the, over the ocean there, I can hang up a, a, a full-size 40-meter dipole in there and then just droop the legs down the, down, the, um, down the trunks of those trees for 80 meters. But look, it's right over top of the ocean there. And so I just get a beautiful takeover, a takeoff from there with... Um, just with a simple dipole. Uh, in all of my expeditions, I either take a, a simple dipoles like a, a fan dipole frequently, which is on 40, and, uh, 40, 80, and 20, or I'll use uh, vertical antennas and we'll get to those uh, shortly. But that's my uh, operating position from the Cook Islands. Lovely, isn't it? And uh, in the moment you fire up on uh, Oh, that was in the JT-65 days. But the moment you fire up on anything digital, bam, the, the screen turns red. Now, those of you done FT8 or any digital stuff, you'll realize that that's, that's everybody under the sun calling you all at once. <laughs> and so um, you, don't, you don't have to beg for calls for sure. The, the screen is perpetually red and I, I'll just go and, and choose those uh, I normally try to choose them in a sequential order. It gets pretty difficult at times. Sometimes yeah. I use the foxhound mode, um, but that tends to cause more chaos than anything from a foxhound mode. And uh, the, the reason being, guys, that um, I've only got a, a, a Alicraft KX3, and sometimes I'll take a 100-watt amplifier. So you get 100 watts. 100 watts maximum with the wind behind you on a very good day. <laughs> uh, now, if you start using Foxhound mode, then for every um, extra chaser that you put on or hound that you put on, uh, that halves your output power. So instead of, instead of somebody getting a full whack of a 100 watts, you'll only get 50 watts if there's two of you, 25 watts if there's four of you. <laughs> And so you get the law of diminishing returns after a while. And yeah, I, I actually prefer going one-on-one, -on -one, to be honest. Okay, uh, Papua New Guinea then. Uh, Papua New Guinea is up in the uh, in Melanesia, right up in the northwestern side of the, um, the Pacific, if you wish. Um, that happens to be my mode of transport to be able to get from uh, to one of the locations, which I, uh, I go to often. And, uh, but rather delightful indeed. You can see why I put all my radio gear into um, Pelican cases and make sure they're well and truly waterproof and uh, uh, because things are gonna go topsy-turvy otherwise. Now, normally I, I go up to a place called Weewak in Papua New Guinea and uh, to service a, 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 a radio station there. It's an FM broadcast radio station. It's one of the missions up there. And uh, uh, so I, I go up there and, and help them out uh, by keeping their transmitters on air. So, um, uh, which is rather delightful because I can uh, take over one of these um, little huts, uh, normally the one on the left-hand side, as you're seeing, follow that car up that fence line uh, to your left. And there's a little house there, which I normally set up in there right in the center of the, the photo there is the radio station itself and then on the right hand side you've got other various huts for administration etc however there's, there's something great big uh, antenna sitting there in the middle that's 220 feet high um, i'll talk in feet and inches if you, i'm bilingual i can talk in meters if you wish but uh feet and inches is probably more appropriate in it yeah i think so yeah Okay, 220 feet high, and uh, I can uh, get uh, I can uh, get a young lad or a teenage boy. He'll climb up there and, and put the dipoles or my fan dipole at the top of that, and uh, there we go. So you get a get a 20 meter dipole or whatever you want at the top of uh, top of a mast like that. Uh, people can hear you. Uh, very well indeed actually <laughs> and uh, often I'll use that uh, to sling 80 meter dipoles off it. I also uh, will use the tower itself it's an insulated tower so 
I can actually load the tower itself on 160 meters. And uh, mm -hmm. yeah, works extremely well. Rolly, do you get interference from the radio station transmitter though, when you, when you set up there? No, I don't get interference. I have to be very careful. I don't interfere with them. Gotcha. Um, it's an FM broadcast. So they're right, right, they're right up into the FM broadcast type frequencies. Okay, sure. So operating CW uh, data and so on, it's fine. The only problem is that uh, I can, uh, don't, uh, don't get into their transmitters, but I can, uh, if I'm not careful, um, get RFI into their mixing desks and or their computers or whatever else. And so just be, be a bit careful. Now that, that's okay when I'm up in WeWAC at the broadcast station there and so on like that. But when I get out to the villages, uh, which I quite often do, then uh, you've got, you got a heap of vegetation around, slinging diapoles up into banana trees and so on. It, you, can, you can do it. it. Just trying to thread wires around the jungle stuff is not easy. So I normally uh, then use a uh, vertical, and the vertical I normally take with me is one of the DX commander type verticals, and uh, they work extremely well. This young man is uh, very, very keen on radio. He, he's uh, the station manager at that previous station I showed you. He would love to get a, um, uh, uh, a radio license. There are no nationals that are uh, licensed in Papua New Guinea. So every time I go up there, I take him, take him through a, a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more. And over the period of time, he, he's, he's very near, in fact, I think probably next time I get up there, I can probably take him through the exam and get him um, get him licensed. In which case, uh, I've left that uh, uh, pole up there for him to use. To, he's got a receiver up there. And uh, uh, as soon as he gets licensed, uh, we'll get him a, uh, oh, I don't know, an Icom 7300 or something like that and uh, get him on the air. And uh, he'll be the first uh, national at... Uh, uh, Papua New Guinea that's uh, on here. So that, that's uh, exciting. We're looking forward to that. His name's Isaac. And there he is showing off the DX Commander in my little alley, yeah, the little Alleycraft KX3 again. Uh, I think I got my headphones back. I'm not sure. Again, as soon as you fire up in, the, in anywhere like this, this is the sort of thing you'll find on data. The, 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 your screen just turns red almost instantly and uh, with um, stations calling and there's well as long as you can sit there and uh, you're prepared to sit there uh, you can work uh, stations left right and center early do you um when you see that do you ever get tempted to just pick out those uh any rare stations you actually see in there yourself or desired stations you just let it roll top top to bottom that kind of thing Oh, you're asking some of the secrets now, aren't you? <laughs> it's okay. You don't have to answer it. <laughs> you know what? Uh, very often I, I will, um, uh, mostly I just let it roll. It's, easy, it's the easiest way. And, and it uh, tends to give everybody a fair go too. Right? First in, first out. And uh, it's, you just let the software do it. But occasionally um, uh, what I like to do is run down that list and I'll find the weakest station. I'll find something that is coming into me at R minus 24 or something like that, you know? Right, okay. <laughs> and I'll give that a burst. And uh, you can almost you can almost feel the excitement the other end. Woohoo, I made it, you know? <laughs> yeah, well, I, I was wondering, then, uh, when you're up at WeWAC, was there much, there was an awful lot of very intense and vicious fighting there during World War II. Has that been pretty much cleaned up in that area? Yes, in WeeWAC, uh, that's fine. Uh, um, now, different story if you're going to go inland up to the highland areas. Um, but I, well, even so, even in WeeWAC, I, I never go walking around the place by myself. I always take uh, two or three of the big uh, local boys uh, with me. Uh, it just discourages what they call the rascals, uh, who are high on high on alcohol and high on Beetle, Beetlejuice. You know, 
they just want to cause a bit of trouble as well. You get two or three big boys, you can they can sort them out really, really quickly. <laughs> now, going up, up into the highlands nowadays, uh, I'd be a little hesitant myself. Um, the white man is not looked on uh, with favor. I do have the distinct advantage of being a New Zealander. So I make sure that uh, I have my I have a cap on which says New Zealand or a t-shirt on which says New Zealand. Um, we have no problems. But unfortunately, if you're if you're, you're American or you're Australian, uh, they somehow have a uh, a dislike. Some, well, I think that it goes back historically because uh, they've been particularly in the highlands, there's been all sorts of promises made with the natural gas and the gold and the, the natural resources. And I think that some of that finance has come back into the country, but it doesn't actually get down to the villages where it counts, it gets to the government, where the, which is highly corrupt, and that's where, it stand, that's where it finishes. So, you know, naturally enough, the local villages get pretty ticked off for that sort of thing. So uh, there it is. Okay, excuse me, mate. Okay, that's fine. Okay, so, yep. Uh, just taking care of uh, <laughs> some of the domestics. Uh, so, uh, so uh, to answer your question, WeWAC is quite safe, yes. Port Moresby, which is the capital of the city, uh, don't go wandering around there uh, by yourself either. It's just um, full of people just really wanting to uh, cause mischief. So, it's any of the hotels you go to in Port Moresby uh, will uh, certainly have um, uh, a six to 12 foot um, fencing right around it with uh, razor wire across the top and all that sort of stuff. Uh, you feel like you're a, a prisoner actually because you go up there uh, into a, a holiday inn or something like that and uh, you're, lock you're actually locked in. You, you can't go out of the grounds of the of the Holiday Inn unless you're escorted, for sure. So, yeah, I feel safe enough up in WeWAC myself because, uh, well, mainly because I'm known, I guess. But uh, all due precautions, I guess. Did that answer your question? Yeah? Yep. Right. Okay, we're on to Timor Lease. Timor Lease now is up uh, that's, uh, directly north of Australia. <clears throat> Um, to the east of um, Indonesia, tucked in there, little wee small country. There's been uh, problems in Timor Leste in the past as well, where um, Timor Leste is, is interesting. It's called East Timor. There's a there's a, the vast majority of the country is a, is um, to the top end of um, Timor. And then um, the bottom end is West Timor, and which is Indonesian owned, except in that Indonesian owned, like, there's a little wee postage stamp size um, bit of land, which is also called East Timor, <laughs> isolated all by its little self. And uh, that's where uh, all the problem has been. It's, it's quite disputed, that little bit of area. Other than that, um, um, uh, no problems at all. Um, Getting the license in East Timor is a nightmare. Uh, yes, you can get a license, obviously, uh, but uh, you can't, uh, like uh, on the right hand side here, you see my license for Papua New Guinea. That, that's very easy. I send them an email, say, I'm here, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be here, here, there on those, these particular days. License, please. It'll come back on email, done. Uh, we'll get back to that one. Uh, uh, that's fairly easy. East Timor, on the other occasion, no, you can't do that. You can't get a license online. Yeah, you, or they won't issue a license online. You can get into all sorts of email um, correspondence with them, but they won't actually physically give you the license online. So you've got to arrive at uh, East Timor. Now, the, your day one, you have to make now, uh, go down and find the... Um, the administration in, uh, in uh, Delhi and make an appointment to see the engineer. 
That appointment won't be that day. I guarantee it'll be the next day. You come back now and you make an appointment with the engineer and put your case. In which case, uh, if he says, uh, they, will, they will agree. But now they give you a raft of paperwork to fill out. Can you fill it out there and then? No, take it away with you. Come back the next day with your paperwork completed. Your paperwork now will be uh, uh, inspected and so on like that. And invariably they'll now ask you, well, what sort of equipment are you operating? We want to inspect the equipment. So you come back the next day with your Allicraft KX3 with a lump of wire and you fire it up on their bench and you demonstrate to them what amateur radio is like. And I think all they really were interested in was just seeing what modern equipment looks like. <laughs> And uh, that being the case, oh yes, that's uh, fine, sir. Yeah, great. Now we will put. Uh, now we will uh, present your application to the president because we have to have the president's signature on your application before we can issue your license. That's what are we up to? Day three or four now? Day five now. You come back and uh, uh, pay your uh, fifty US dollars and uh, you'll be given a, a license signed by the president. Now you can go away and operate. So it'll, it'll take you at least three or four, maybe five days of your, however long you're gonna be in East Timor just to get your license. <laughs> this can be extremely frustrating and so on like that. Um, and uh, of course, obeying all the protocols uh, of that particular country uh, at the same time. Uh, guys, you dare not uh, arrive at their office in a pair of shorts uh, or um, flip-flops or something like that. No, you must be dressed uh, with uh, suitable trousers, a, a shirt and preferably a tie with shoes. <laughs> uh, uh, women, for instance, if they had, uh, if their shoulders were um, exposed, they would not be allowed into the building. And, uh, it, it, there's a raft of protocol and all that sort of stuff, which has to be uh, adhered to there as well. Interesting stuff. And so once again, this to the station, which I was at, there to um, uh, help them out with and service stuck up on top of a mountain. That's an FM broadcast station again. And uh, looking down from that station down into the, uh, the city of Dili. So I was able to operate from that inside that hut, which is very, very hot indeed. Uh, now, you're gonna have to bear with me or somebody's gonna have to do some uh, recalculations. The, the temperature inside that hut was the constant 37 degrees Celsius translate that into Fahrenheit and then and, and you find that, uh, that uh, it, it's pretty warm, right? And that's with all the, that's with the doors open and everything, uh, hopefully with the breeze blowing as well. So it, I need to say I didn't spend too much time in, in there and I, and I operated from down a, a place down in um, the city. Problem was operated down in the city. It was very, very noisy, extremely noisy. And I may have a, photo. Ah, we'll, we'll get to that. Uh, the electrics up there are, are, are to something to behold. I mean, very rarely will you find a, a, a screwed um, joint or something like that. Most of the joints are just twisted together. <laughs> She'll be right. Yeah. This is our means of getting our equipment from Dilly up to the top of that mountain, packed it into boxes, and that's in the that's in the, um, the boot, um, the trunk. You call it a trunk, right? Trunk of a taxi. <laughs> Can you take that up to the top of the mountain for us? Yes. Uh, this is a mode of transport around most of Dilly. There's a whole family on there. There's a family of five on that uh, little mo uh, motor scooter there. Mum and dad, there's a little boy standing in the, in the front of his, and, uh, uh, then his sister is uh, held in by dad, and then uh, his other sister is held in by mum at the back. Interesting, isn't it? Mum and dad's had the helmets. Uh, the uh, the kids, uh, well, I don't know what happens there. <laughs> this is very, very common, though. This is just that's the way it is. I mean, uh, you can imagine some of, the, of our New Zealand uh, OSH authorities or your American uh, 
health and safety would have a field day, wouldn't they? So that's a that's a team or less. So now anyway, we move on to Solomon Islands, another delightful place, just a little bit to the west of. Um, come a little bit south from Papua New Guinea and go a little bit west and we get into the Solomon Islands. Solomon Islands, are, from an American point of view, is an absolute fascinating study if you're into um, World War II um, uh, stories and paraphernalia with all the Guadal Canal and, and, and all that sort of stuff. It, it's really fascinating. In fact, some of the jungles uh, that I've walked through here on, in, uh, on some of the islands in, Solomon, in the Solomon Islands uh, you, you still stumble across uh, aircraft that uh, in relatively good condition just uh, hung up in the trees. And uh, uh, yeah, there, there for any uh, World War II fanatic to go and get some bits and pieces for their aircraft. Uh, flying into one of the islands, I think this is the island of Giza. Uh, you have to get it right first time because at the end of that runway, which is very, very short indeed, is just straight out into the lagoon. So you're definitely going to get wet. So uh, make sure you, you either get it right or you make sure you get your go around real quick. And of course, it's uh, these are turboprop uh, planes that we're flying. And that was me just looking out, um, out the front, um, seeing what the uh, pilot's seeing with his hand on the throttle there and ready to go around if necessary. So very, very short runways. In fact, that whole island is, is the runway, that's it. Then out into one of the villages, uh, and now this, this will make the heart race of those of you that are DXs and uh, that, uh, that are interested in antennas. What do you see there? Oh, it's all quiet. Antenna mounts. I, I see, a, I see at least one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Uh, I see a little, about twenty odd verticals sitting, sitting there. <laughs> <laughs> All of those trees are uh, well. Many of those trees are anywhere between forty to sixty feet high, and it. Um, uh, those of you that are sensitive to nature, put your, your fingers in your ears now. It only costs you one one uh, uh, cigarette, as provided it's a lucky strike cigarette, uh, to get one 12 year old boy to climb those trees all day for you. <laughs> uh, that's the local currency. And uh, so uh, you can get antennas slung between those uh, trees uh, often, and I have a. Um, once again, dipoles slung between between two coconut trees at 40, 50 feet high. Absolutely fantastic. Works a, works a treat. Or you can uh, run up a run a wire up the side of one of them and uh, and off off uh, at a, at an L like an um, inverted L for 160 meters or or even uh, 80 meters. Beautiful. So. That little hut there looks pretty run down and ramshackle. Uh, it is. Uh, however, I'm, I'm quite happy to bunk up in there because at least it has no windows and there's a hole in the roof. That's great. There's going to be some sort of ventilation uh, provided I've got a mosquito net that I can um, hunker down underneath. That would be beautiful. Um, there'll be a local uh, diesel uh, generator out the back of that that I can use. I uh, said another location, one of the colleagues that came up there with me were just uh, putting together just a simple pipe antenna to put a, uh, a small, um, uh, it'll be a small vertical, um, I'd say a folded can't quite see there. I think it's probably a folded dipole uh, vertical at the top of that for once again for um, FM broadcast. And that little uh, that little hut there is on top of a uh, on the other side of that. It just goes straight down to the uh, lagoon. Uh, probably about um, 150, 200 feet maybe. Just straight down into the lagoon. So perfect takeoff. 
and nice and comfortable little um, uh, QDH for a change. Uh, once again, uh, disregard the safe, uh, safety and health aspects of things. Uh, to strap a pole up against the side of the building and uh, where we go. Western Samoa, uh, five whiskey, zero radio, radio. Uh, delightful place again. I normally go to Apollo Island. There are uh, four or five major islands on it. On, uh, in Samoa, there's Apollo Island is the largest, then Savai Island, uh, it's almost uh, as large, and a couple of smaller islands between the two. You are a proper Samoan, apparently, if you've been to all four. Uh, I've been to all four, so uh, I often get called, oh, you're a real Samoan then, so, <laughs> yeah. And uh, once again, at a, uh, this is at a commercial radio station uh, there. There's a tower in the back there. I can use that tower uh, right up against the lagoons and so on like that, or one of these, uh, either one of these two towers. I uh, can um, often get to, uh, somebody to climb those and put um, just simple, simple wire antennas hung from the top and uh, it works remarkably well. And, uh, oh, this is a lap of luxury. So I can actually got a desk in, in a room and I can sit down and <laughs> do some operating. Um, any of you worked a station called Five Whiskey, One Sugar Alpha, 5W1SA. Uh, he's a Japanese guy that uh, is resident on Samoa. He's been there for 18 years now. He's married a lovely uh, Samoan girl. And uh, uh, that's uh, uh, Atsu's uh, QTH. And uh, the last time I was up there, I counted uh, five or six different linear amplifiers. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, he's got a lot going on here. Yeah, this. yeah, he collects Gosh. them like uh, like most people call uh, click handy talkers. So. But uh, right at the back there, you notice uh, there's a bed there. That's um, often been my bed where I've uh, just uh, rolled out of there and grab a radio and start operating from. So Atu uh, loves me coming up there because his Jap even though he's been there for 18 years and so on, lad, his, his English is still not great. And uh, he... He loves it when I arrive so that we can get onto 15 meters or something like that and work the Europeans. Because uh, he says, I don't mind the, the Japanese and everybody, but he said, I, I find it difficult to work Europeans. One, he said, I, the, the, the various accents he finds difficult, but I think it's the um, operating procedure that you sometimes get out of Europe <laughs> it can be a little bit hard to deal with. So I said, right, that's fine, Atsu. Swing these beams around on 15 meters. Give me everything you got. Let's go. Nice. <laughs> and he, he, he sits, uh, sits there on the, uh, at the back there with this huge big grin on his face as I'm plowing through all these Europeans. He, he loves it. So. A35RR, that's in Tonga. Uh, we're coming back now uh, down through the Pacific, uh, closer and closer to home, back to New Zealand. Uh, Tonga is a, another one of these lovely islands, which are um, easy to get to, uh, easy to get licensing from. Uh, your, your American licensure is, uh, is great. You can just get a reciprocal Tongan license. You'll have to operate a, a A35 stroke uh, K7 BWH or uh, etc. Right, but uh, that no, that's no problem. What's going on Look, in this picture here, Rolly? It looks like a. This is this is one of the problems that you find <clears throat> in the Pacific, but in Tonga in particular, and that is uh, uh, we do get a lot of hurricanes or cyclones come down through that particular part of the Pacific. And uh, what fascinates me about this shot there, there's, you can see a young, young girl there and another lady just in the background, just wandering around. Yeah. There's, a, there's a cyclone <laughs> running on. Just going out for groceries. You, <laughs> you, can see how, you can see how strong the wind is. Have a look at the heads of those two coconut trees there. Right? No, they're, they're normally up the other way. They're, they're 
uh, you know, 45 degrees from there. And they're normally pointing straight out. Now those things, when they when they get a little bit beyond, the, well, not too much beyond that actually, those heads just come off. And now you've got a, a the head of a coconut tree, like a it's just like a, a ballistic missile. It, it, it hits anything, it just wipes it out. And that's one of the dangers of, uh, of these cyclones. Yeah, there they are, the locals just wandering around. Okay, so we've got another cyclone. <laughs> Bring it on. And that's often the damage. Uh, it's quite devastating, really. But uh, uh, that's often the reaction as well. Oh, well. She's right. Let's tidy it up and let's carry on. Still have the big smile on his face and we, we carry on. That And that is so typifies uh, much of the uh, Pacific attitude uh, to life and in general, I guess. So we have these things, we, we bear with them. Uh, this uh, was one of the operating positions uh, I operated just straight off the lagoon. You can see a little dipole on top of that um, telephone pole, really. It's not very high off the ground, but the very fact that it's right, you know, only a couple of steps into the lagoon, um, you get the salt water like that so, cl so close to your operating position, so close to your antennas. Uh, it uh, certainly adds, um, adds a few dB uh, to your signal on transmit. And certainly uh, uh, a few more dB on receive as well. So um, almost anywhere in the islands, uh, you're, you're not too far away from the sea. And that's what you get at the end of the day too, isn't that great? It's just absolutely nice. beautiful. And so uh, um, when, I, when I see the sun on the horizon like that, um, again, yeah, and I... Uh, I'm a lucky guy to be up here and enjoying that sort of thing. And, it, and it's also a very good indication that it's time to switch to 80 meters. So there we go. <laughs> you ever see the green flash? Yes, occasionally. Yeah, occasionally. But uh, uh, there it is. Well, that's, that's just about it for the Pacific and so on like that. Just a couple of things which I want to add in, and that's all the modern stuff that, that I've been doing. And uh, I think it, what more than anything, it just gives you a bit of a flavour of what's out there and uh, what you can expect and uh, what you can do out in the Pacific. But um, what have we done? A couple more here. Yes. Let's let's go back and then in 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 antiquity a little bit. <laughs> Uh, that's me as a young man or a younger man there in the middle. Goodness, I had hair then. Okay. The gentleman uh, behind uh, with his hand uh, to his forehead, that's uh, John Zeta 1 AS. He's, uh, he's now silent key. And uh, the other guy on the right hand side of the photo there with the sunglasses on, that's uh, Dwayne uh, W6REC. And he uh, accompanied us up to the um, uh, Kermitic Islands. And this, uh, this is the boat that we went on up to the Kermitic Islands. Uh, this the the crew that the uh, sorry for the quality of the photos, guys. These are some photos which I resurrected uh, off um, uh, thirty-five millimeter slides, <laughs> which. Uh, I found in the attic about uh, six months ago, and um, they've been around for 30, 32 years. So this is the best I could pull out of them. So we, uh, from left to right, we have Dwayne W6REC, myself, uh, holding the that, uh, dog uh, named Stinky, uh, which was rather appropriate name for it. Uh, next to me is John Z1AAS. He is silent key now. And then on the end is Ron Z1AMO, also silent key. Oh, yes. Now, any of you that are, uh, have been uh, CW operators at all would have come across Ron Z1AMO at some time or other, I'm sure. I, I, I'm, I was good friends with Ron. 
Right. He's in, he's in my log. Yeah, I'm sure. Uh, Ron won't mind you. Well, he, he can't object now, can he? Uh, I, I remember Ron was one of these world's uh, experts on CW. And, and, I, and I, Hi. Have you been? There's, there's nobody that will dispute that, I'm sure. Frustrating beyond. Bigger pardon? Sorry, I missed that comment. Okay. Oh, that was uh, that was Princess Leia, I believe. <laughs> okay. We now let me tell you a story with Ron. Ron, um, being an expert in CW and so on, he used to get a little bit impatient, and he was also a very heavy smoker. So uh, he would often. In fact, he's got a cigarette in his jolly hand there now. If you look very closely. <laughs> I hadn't noticed that before. Here's Ron. He'd be, he, he refused to buy his own cigarettes. He always roll his own. So he's rolling his own cigarette. And at the same time, keep on rolling, rolling. Tuck one in behind one ear like that. Grab another Ron. Rolling. Put the other one in his other ear like that and, and carry on operating. And at the same time, he'd also be looking over his shoulder and having a conversation with me on the other side of the room as well. Well, on one particular time, I th I'm not sure whether it was Kermit or whether it, when it was down at the Aucklands there, I was sort of half listening to what Ron was doing on CW and I was running a, uh, an SSB uh, pilot. And then I stopped because I thought, what on earth is he playing at? Now, I'll, I'll use a couple of call signs here. So N7PHY had called Ron, and uh, instead of just giving a 5-9 uh, on your way, he said, uh, yeah, name's Ed. Uh, we live here, and uh, the, I got my dog with me, and uh, it's a lovely fine day. And Ron got, oh, sod that. <coughs> K7BWH, you're 5-9. K7BWH, yeah, my name's Barry, and uh, uh, I live in such and such. And K KD7 in uh, WNV, you're 5'9". Five 5'9 nine. Five nine says KD7 WNV, QSO in. Oh, at this time, we hear a... Uh, and uh, and 73 from uh, K7BWH, yeah, 73, thank you. And 73 from N7PHY, yeah, 73, da 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 all three of you have had a simultaneous QSO and none of you have known the other one is having the QSO. It's almost like parentheses, right? N7PHY, K7BWH, KD7WNY, and he works his way back in again. None of you have known that he's talking to the other, the other two and so he's had three QSOs all in one. <laughs> At the same time, while he's still rolling cigarettes, putting them behind here and talking to me on the other side of the room as well. And, and he often used to do that. When, uh, if somebody was a little bit slow, he would, he'd work two stations almost almost simultaneous, and, and none, none of them were any of the wiser. I tried doing that myself on single sideband uh, a, a couple of times. It, it, <laughs> you can do it. The only problem is when it goes wrong, it goes awfully wrong. <laughs> so, yeah. Anyway, that's a, that's a little bit of a story from Ron. Uh, now to get onto the Kermitic Islands, that's the only way you can get on. I'm sorry, guys. Uh, you uh, the boat, the ship comes up uh, as close to shore as possible. We then uh, take a, uh, a little rubber dinghy to get us uh, underneath this uh, mobile or this this crane. This crane uh, um, as a as a hook, as you see, like that with with a ladder on it. And uh, now what you do, you you you're in the boat. And you time the swell so that as the swell and the ladder come together, you jump on and grab hold, grab hold of that ladder and hang on for dear life. And uh, then they will winch you up uh, out of the water, uh, swing the whole derrick around and lower you back down onto ground. And that's the only way in which we could get onto the island. And, all, and that basket you see in the boat down there, that's what our, all our um, radio gear came ashore the same way. I think that's, uh, that looks like me and um, John, I think, clinging onto the ladder there at, the, at that stage. 
Now, interesting part of this one, you might have to get up close to your screens on this one. See where right about in the middle of the photo there, we have the, 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 the waves breaking on the shore and you've got a bit of blue water and then just out from the blue water, there's a little bit of a white, sort of like a white finger sticking out. Um, it's interesting because that's that. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Uh, we uh, had one of these famous storms that came down from Tonga. And um, now apparently uh, I'm, not, I'm not a yachtsman or not a sailor at all. But apparently the, the, uh, what you do if a storm comes down, you, you go out to sea and you ride out, ride out ahead of the storm, wait for the storm to blow itself out turn around and come back home again. Uh, the skipper decided to do that, but uh, instead of going out to sea, he went around the other side of the island into a, into a cove, which we call Boat Cove, and uh, anchored in there. And it all was fine, except that the storm went across the island, looked down, saw this little boat down there. Oh, I know what to do with that. And the storm backed up and came back the other way picked the boat up and threw it onto the rocks and uh, there it is there you see it under under water and uh, yeah under water like that so that was uh, that's the way it stayed and of course it's a ferro cement boat and uh, if any of you know what no it's made of concrete and wire right and uh, so and uh, in very short order that uh, the boat just disintegrated under water and uh, that was it. So we had to get uh, a passing freighter that was coming down from Tonga to uh, pick us up from the island. And here, here's uh, Ron, I think it is, clambering up the side of the ship to try and get on board uh, for, in order for us to get back uh, home to New Zealand. The New Zealand uh, Navy were going to come and get us, but uh, uh, the price for that was uh, horrendous. <laughs> Unfortunately, my wife, who also has a call sign, Z01 Foxtrot Victoria, um, uh, we were able, able to get um, in touch with Gail, and uh, Gail was able to organise um, this freighter to come and pick us up. So we got back to Auckland that way. And that's the, uh, the boat that we came back on. And there you go, guys. So that's uh, that's the end of the presentation I have for you tonight. And uh, uh, look, I'm, I'm more than willing to kick around and answer any questions that uh, some of you may have or whatever you'd like. Open, okay. open forum. So. Oh, thank you, Rolly. The, I like how you end with a shipwreck and a, and a rescue. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, well, uh, it'd probably, you know... Um, uh, you, you, you saw all the nice stuff of a D expedition, but you know, sometimes right. a D expedition can turn, turn belly up very quickly indeed. And, uh, and it's no longer, yeah, it's no longer a row of skittles, is it? Right. Oh, that's amazing. What adventures. Oh my gosh. What, what do you do out there at the radio stations, Rolly? What's your uh, role that brings you out? Okay. Uh, my, my professional life has been a, I'm a radio broadcast engineer from um, since Adam was uh, involved in uh, CW. So uh, um, I work for a very large broadcaster here in New Zealand as the, the chief radio engineer for that company. And that was a FM broadcast, AM broadcast, um, TV, you know, just like any of the very large broadcasters. Mm -hmm. And that was, uh, uh, while we were at, uh, while I was out there, we set up a, uh, a reciprocal type of arrangement with m many of the Pacific Islands that uh, um, we would uh, contract to look after their broadcast stations for them. Most of them are, are Christian broadcast stations or uh, religious type broadcasting stations of various kinds. Um, so we contracted with them to look after their stations for them on a, on a as required or as needed basis. And, um, well, I was a boss, so uh, uh, <laughs> it was too much of a temptation not to say, well, I'll go and do that. And 
Sure. If you're going to go to an island, um, you might as well take a radio with you, huh? Oh, fantastic. Well, what are you going to do when the sun goes down? You know? <laughs> oh, that's amazing. And so that's how I got to um, operate from a lot of these islands. And then so uh, being at, at these various islands, I'd be uh, fixing up um, uh, commercial radios. Uh, uh, typically, the either ten or uh, ten or twenty kilowatt um, um, FM stations. Sure. Some of the uh, broadcast station, uh, some of the AM or shortwave stations, will get up to uh, fifty kilowatt. Uh, that can be a bit of fun. Eh? You get an AM station, and um, while it's out of service, uh, tune, tune it up onto the one hundred and sixty meter band with uh, with ten kilowatts. That's uh, that can be a bit of fun. <laughs> nice. Yeah. Okay. So what's kind of uh, from a from a licensing point of view, uh, it, it became very simple with me because I was doing it also while I was out there looking at many of the uh, the Christian broadcasting stations. They they co-site uh, a lot of co-siting goes on in these places. So you'll have a commercial uh, FM station as well as. Uh, there might be six or seven different stations all on the one tower. Uh, even sometimes they share the, uh, uh, with um, suitable combiners, you can share the same antennas. Uh, and so while I'm there, I'm, I'm also looking after, uh, if I see something wrong with one of the commercial stations, I'll, I'll go, oh, hold on. Uh, that needs a bit of attention as well. So, uh, when the commercial boys knew that I was on my way, they'd, they'd, they'd have a few jobs lined up as well. So now I'm interfacing now with the government authorities and so on like that, and most of them have never heard of our ham radio. So I, uh, I go, well, uh, like in Papua New Guinea, they, they say, well, you want, a, you want a ham radio? What do you mean you want a ham radio license? I said, well, this is the way it's done. Here's your rules and regulations. Okay, right. This is the way in which you fill out this particular form. Uh, and I'd fill it all out. And now what I would do is I would pay you a, a token amount, uh, say 20 kina, that's $10 US. And uh, now you type up uh, this, this form here and give that to me. And I give you the 20 kina. And now I have an operating license, which allows me to legally operate um, here in Papua New Guinea. And I'll use a call sign P29RR. Oh, okay then. Bye. <laughs> and that and that story uh, is can be repeated through most of the islands. Hence the reason why I've got the uh, RR as a suffix for uh, just about all of my calls and out throughout the Pacific. Barry, you had your hand up. Barry. Yeah, hi. I was going to ask, and the, the pileups you get are, are just inconceivable. And I've been through a few pileups, the target of a few little pileups myself. So what kind of strategies do you use in WSJT? Do you like move off frequency to your own channel or try to run split receive transmit frequencies or manage the pileup? Or what do you do? I, I normally just try to manage the pileup as much as I can, Barry. I have used Foxhound before, but uh, as I say, when... Foxhound works very well, provided you've got a decent um, decent amount of power from the from the Fox point of view. You have to have a decent amount of power uh, to, to run because every time uh, you bring on another hound, if you're operating two or three or four, your power output gets spread amongst the two or three or four that you're operating. So if you're starting off with 100 watts and you go down to and you're operating four hounds at a time, you you're really only getting uh, they're only really getting 25 watts uh, allocated per each of the hounds, and that that can that can be um, yeah just simply not enough. So now what you've done is you you're getting a lot of repeats, repeats, repeat, repeat. So you you um, you actually uh, cause more problems than you're solving. And so I, in that case, I normally will go uh, back to just one-on-one. -on -one. And uh, in a very occasion, I will announce that instead of operating on 064, say uh, 14064, I'll operate on 14062. And uh, that then gets 
rid of those that are not interested in Papua New Guinea, um, gets rid of them, and you, you got a bunch now which you can more or less manage. So, so can you tell them I'm working W7s only, and if you do, do they cooperate? You can attempt to do that on uh, uh, on, on uh, FT8, but it's 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 a difficult uh, task to achieve, to be honest, because uh, unless you're uh, on sideband, it's easy, CW, it's easy, but on FT8, unless you make that announcement on every call, uh, you'll get new people coming into the pilot, but you've got no idea. Oh. Yeah. Now, on, on sideband, you can say, okay, uh, W7, 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 QIZ, W7, QIZ, W7. Uh, it's easy, but not so easy on FDA. No. I normally work them on a, a as come, as come uh, basis, you know. Well, that's, okay. that's interesting, but people will figure out that WSJT goes through the band from low audio frequencies to high, and it will list the guy as lowest first. So pretty soon they all catch on and they all tune down to be like 600 hertz in your passband or something. Yep, yep. In, in which case I can see that happening as well. So then I'll start, uh, I'll start choosing those at the other end. You, know, you, might as, you might as well make it easy for yourself. It's the, it's the same as on sideband or CW. Why do you go split frequency? You know, it's, it's, to, it's really from the uh, de-expedition's point of view to make it easy on, on, on yourself. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, there are, there are tricks and things like that around, to work around it, uh, Barry, but um, um, more than anything, it's just uh, being patient, persevering. <laughs> Ain't that yeah. the truth. Anybody else got any questions? Do you have a favorite DX location? Um, from a, I, I like Papua New Guinea uh, simply because I've been there a few times. What I dislike about Papua New Guinea is the constant 37 to 40 degrees Celsius with uh, 90 to 95% humidity all the time, all right? Uh, the, the the climate up there, it, it, there is no such thing as summer, winter, autumn, and spring. It's either um, hot and dry or hot and wet. Those those are your two alternatives. So you have a, a dry season and a wet season. When it's wet, it's very wet. When it's dry, it's also very dry. But you also you, you get the humidity all the time. So from a, a personal comfort point of view, it's uh, if you're out in the jungles, it's, it's not a not a real good. Uh, well, it's not really a barrel of monkeys for sure. But I, I, I just simply like the I like the people. I like the place. It uh, and it uh, treats me very well as far as the de expedition goes. The if you really want to go and uh, and have a lovely holiday and do some de xing as you uh, at the same time, uh, nip on out to the Maldive Islands. Eight Q seven XR. Absolutely fantastic, beautiful locations, and uh, absolutely perfect. You could take your wife there, and she'd be very, very happy. <laughs> you take your wife to Papua New Guinea, and uh, well, I've done it once, and I've, uh, I've given the invitation out several other times. <laughs> so, uh, a favorite? I don't know. Uh, now, uh, another very nice, easy uh, walk in the park, so to speak, is uh, Southern Cook Islands. There's a, you can set up in a, in a hotel, a motel, or in, it just beautiful places there. Uh, you could take the whole family there for a holiday, and they, they would not object at all. Uh, and you can get some, um, do some de-exing as well. And there's a... Um, Two or three resident uh, amateurs on on uh, Southern Cook Island, but none of them like uh, they all they're all ragtures amongst themselves on the island, <laughs> and uh, not very many of them uh, operate DX or such. So you know, you, you, I go up there, uh, give them a, give them a yell, and go around and 
have a cup of coffee and then I say, oh, and then they almost want to want me to leave and get on the radio and work some DX and get this DX off our, off our shoulders, will you please? <laughs> yeah. Hey, Rolly, what's your, um, what's your go-to antenna these days when you're traveling to the islands? Or do you have one? Do you kind of pick and choose? Yeah, I do. Um, I guess most of you have heard of the DX Commander. Anybody not? Yeah, yeah, I actually have one. We we bring we bring that up every once in a while. It's uh, okay. It's known. Uh, Callum and I you get on like a house on fire. Where uh, we I've, I've worked with Callum for a long, long time now. The, the uh, first um, time I went out, I took a DX Commander Classic, and that's that one that I showed you with that young fellow in Papua New Guinea there holding it. Um, DX Commander. That's a DX Commander Classic. The problem with the DX Commander Classic is it's uh, one and a half meters or nearly four foot long, uh, packed down. Try getting that into the overhead locker of, a, of an aeroplane <clears throat> and you can't. So now it means that you've got to take an extra bit of luggage with you. And uh, I'm already it's a one-man de expedition, remember. Whatever I can get into my backpack is what I take. Because um, a couple of things uh, from here, I've done a lot of traveling out in New Zealand now, so I, I can take 56 kilos of, uh, of luggage out of New Zealand. That's two big suitcases if I wanted. Mm -hmm. And that'll get me as far as Brisbane from, uh, from there on in, from Brisbane up to Papua New Guinea or the Solomons and so on. It's almost like domestic flights. And they will only allow me 17 kg. Oh, wow. So the difference between 17 kg and 56 kg, if I want to take all that, it's free from New Zealand to Brisbane. From there on in, it gets charged as uh, excess luggage. And uh, they see you coming a mile away, and uh, the, <laughs> the charges on excess luggage uh, internally, it's just horrendous. So in... In reality, I've only got about 17, maybe 20 kg at most that I can take with me. So uh, that's why if, if I can get in the backpack, that's fine. Uh, now, so now I've got a, a DX Commander um, a Classic, which is four foot long. It's another, pe it's another piece of luggage. Once again, they see another piece of luggage as something, oh, that's out of the normal. If it's out of the normal, it's something we can charge you for. And uh, and the number of times that my um, DX commander or uh, something extra that I've taken has gone missing and you can't find it uh, right. until you ask the right questions, which is, can I see your supervisor, please? And uh, then you get a very sheepish, sheepish supervisor comes along and you say, well, l last time it, it cost me uh, 50 kina to, for you to find my missing parcel. I said this time it's going to cost you. It's going to cost me no more than twenty kina. Otherwise, I'm, I'll have to take elevate this. Oh uh, uh, let me have a look, sir. Let me have a look, sir. <laughs> Out comes the parcel. Twenty oh. kina goes across the counter, and you're away. Oh now, if you God. know how to play the game, it's it's no problem. But that that extra parcel can be a problem. And also, I've got to carry the thing. Okay. Right. Already carrying a suitcase, a backpack. Now I've got this other pass. So when I got back from Papua New Guinea, I got hold of Callum and I said, look, can, can we, is there a way in which we can squish this down? I uh, mm -hmm. took the dimensions of my suitcase and I said, I want something that will fit inside the suitcase, which is just a little over two foot long. And so uh, we worked on that for a while. And then we came up with the, uh, the what they call the expedition model. Yeah. It's the same length as the uh, um, uh, the classic, but it folds down to just a little over two feet. Now that fits inside my my uh, my suitcase, along with all the other stuff. It's out of sight, out of mind. I have no problems now with uh, uh, getting in and out of these countries with customs and right. extra luggage and all this sort of stuff. So that's how the expedition model came about. Nice. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> the rest of the story. <laughs> That's awesome. 
uh, inner works are very, very real indeed. In fact, I can often, uh, I've often been guilty of taking two expedition models with me and um, um, putting them on 40 meters and using the second one as a reflector to the oh. driven one. Oh. Right? Now, if you put the, put the driven one up right on the shoreline and then you can um, uh, take the reflector around at all different angles and so on like that and, oh. and actually tune it to where you really, where you want to push your beam. And boy, does that perform. Really? That's just a passive reflector? You're not? Yeah, yeah. just a passive reflector. Oh. A little, a tad under a quarter wavelength away from the driven. Okay. Probably mm -hmm. somewhere between an eighth, an eighth of a wave and a quarter of a wave. It's a sweet spot. Yeah. Mm. Mm -hmm. Making some notes here. And and again, you're right on the you're right on the beach. You're right on the lagoon. So you've got all that beautiful takeoff there. It's just great. Are you still rolling with the uh, Electcraft? Um, Electcraft uh, was the K three. X three, yes, I do because it's uh, it's it's small, it's light, it's easy, it's very transportable. And I take a, a small um, hundred watt amplifier with me. Okay. So, uh, I mean, uh, I guess a. Uh, 7300 or the likes would would be fine but uh, it's it, it becomes one of the logistics remember we're talking about a one man the expedition right so you work it out for yourself what can you what can you feasibly take with yourself and, and still mm -hmm. get an on and off aircraft and mm -hmm. so on like that with it, still take with you without things getting damaged and you know. yeah and, and not costing you an arm and a left leg and, and excess luggage, because it's it's completely when you get you get to these islands, it, you're on your own. It's completely up to you, and so right. you've got to be able to take care of yourself. Hmm. Oh boy, I'm I'm laughing about that now. My deal is I play the game on six meters. I take grid expeditions, and I can't imagine packing things down. It, it doesn't fit in my brain because. I bring a kilowatt and two generators and a five element beam on six meters <laughs> and fill up one of the biggest four wheel drive trucks I can find. I wouldn't know where to begin packing it down to 20. Right, but see, so straight away, you can see how impractical that would be to try and get on the, uh, on a 747 or you know, uh, an Airbus or something like that and uh, shoot across the other side of the world. Yeah. I'm yeah. interested in uh, what, um, what, you use for power supplies, you run into problems finding power? Yes, uh, sometimes it can do. Fortunately, in most of the places I go to, uh, there is um, uh, power available. Don't, uh, I, w I certainly don't rely on grid power. Grid power can be up and down all over the place, but most of these places will have uh, generators of some sort. Uh, oh, okay. those those generators can be um, pretty dodgy at times too. So um, I, because it's light and so on like that, I, I take a switch mode power, uh, uh, switch mode power supplies with me. One, uh, which is a, uh, the one I've got is a 12 volt, uh, which will produce 60 amps. And uh, it does very well. It fires up everything I have, but uh, I don't rely on that completely. I have that really uh, trickle charging a, a small um, small battery. And so I'm running off the battery, mainly because you're using the battery like a, like a thumping great big capacitor to smooth out um, uh, noise, ripple, uh, generators, hunting, and all that sort of stuff. Otherwise, uh, um, yeah, well, you can, you can read your CW in the, in the, uh, on, the, um, on the panel lamps of your transmitter, otherwise. Have any trouble getting those batteries on board the air, aircraft? Yes, uh, now that's, that's a trick indeed. Uh, can I reach over there? Just excuse me one sec. Oh. That's that's the bat that's the pack that I take with me. But, uh, uh, 
Let me put my ears back in again. Professional, a professional presenter would have been organised and had all this in place, wouldn't he? That's the battery which I take. And that's a, a, a LiPo uh, pack, 12.8 uh, amps, 12.8 uh, volts, 7, 7 amp area battery. And uh, that does everything. Works fine. Thank you, thank you. Any other questions? Huh. When can I go, you say? Yeah. Well, I'm going to, that was great there. And I'm going to say to, from one Pahia to another, Kiar <laughs> <laughs> There you go. To which I would respond, Kiara. Yeah. <laughs> All right, guys. Um, Roly, we can't thank you enough. This was really amazing. Really love the presentation. Ah, makes you want to go. Yikes. Well, uh, where's your well, next? As soon as, as soon as we're able to uh, travel again, and there's a, there are some, well, we, our, our bubble, so to speak, has been extended out to Australia now. So we're able to travel across to Australia. Uh, without quarantines and that sort of stuff now, which is good news, and that will soon uh, go out into the, into the rest of the Pacific. I'm fairly confident. And uh, as soon as that occurs, then I'll be up to um, <clears throat> New A uh, as E6 AR. One I more have thing. To, uh, I need to go back to Papua New Guinea because they've got a few problems up there, and likewise, so um, some more. So uh, my uh, wife's brother lives in Brisbane, and we've been there a couple of times, but we'd like to meet them somewhere in between, out in the middle. Uh, what's a good place? <laughs> well, uh, in between, I, I guess, would be Hawaii, but, uh, you know, that's a, it's a, it's a reasonable step for you, and it's a reasonable step for the Australians. But Hawaii is very nice, indeed. Yeah, that, that, we were thinking that, but we're thinking uh, somewhere a little closer, right? But uh, there's not much in between, is there? Closer to whom? Oh, to Brisbane. <laughs> oh, to Brisbane, right. Well, you, you have all sorts of exotic sort of stuff out there, but you, you'd have to get to Brisbane first and then go. Uh, for instance, Norfolk Island or... Um, Fortuna and Wallace Island, uh, yeah, there's all sorts of stuff out there, uh, but uh, you, you, you have to get at that from Australia. To actually um, um, sort of converge somewhere, yeah, Hawaii is about it, I think. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> well, thank you, Roller. You make this all sound so easy and fun, and I know it's a heck of a lot of work and takes a lot of planning, so. Thank you very much for coming with us today. It does take a little bit of planning, but uh, it's it, it's it's not impossible. And uh, um, to be honest, it's a it's a lot of fun. So, hey, it's been my pleasure being with you guys tonight. Uh, Thank you, Roy. Uh, Thank you. Uh, I've, I've Thank enjoyed you it immensely. <laughs> Indeed. Yeah. yeah. Well, Thank you, Roly. Roly, Thank you. Yeah, Roly didn't mention it in his YouTube channel, so I will. There's a lot of great videos covering. I like to let them roll because one will be a travel expedition. The next one is some, a fellow doing his homebrew hydrodynamic power generation at home to power his ham station. It's just amazing, amazing stuff you find out there. Thanks so much, Roly. If you just uh, go onto YouTube and type ZL1BQD, or okay. uh, actually, I've got, got to speak American, don't I? Z, ZL1BQD. ZL. Uh, you'll um, you'll find me. Excellent. And, uh, yeah, actually, there's a lot of a lot of good videos there from the point of view of uh, uh, one particular New Zealand amateur uh, by the name of uh, Gary ZL3 Sugar Victor. <laughs> Have a look at the videos that uh, that are on there. Uh, particularly what uh, one I've entitled, I think, Monster uh, a monster Antenna. Right. And uh, 
no, I won't give away the punchline, but you have a look at that one and, and see what a monster antenna is all about. And then, uh, and then follow on some of the other things. I mean, he's, he's out in the bush here, here in New Zealand. And uh, so he's self-sufficient in solar, uh, self-sufficient with his own water, his own hydro. And uh, so he's dammed up his own water, uh, mainly for, for a firefighting prevention point of view. But if you've got a dam of water, why not make your own hydroelectric mm -hmm. uh, power station as well? So amazing. And all that's, that's on there. It's great stuff. A lot of fun. Yeah, a lot of fun. Great stuff. All right, guys. Should we formally close our, our meeting tonight? Everybody, here we go. Roly, it really was a pleasure. Thank yeah. you so much. All right. Thanks, you're, you're welcome, guys, anytime. Oh, fantastic.